Hi, everyone. I hope you're joining the Canadian Alliance Conference so far. We're here today to talk about and uh, learn what leading change in your community to end homelessness looks like and some tips and tricks on how to help you as a change agent leading change in your local community. As Chantelle mentioned, my name is Amanda and I've spent the better half of my career leaning into leadership theories, uh, practicing those leadership theories in the homelessness serving sector, and then adapting and tailoring those theories as well as business concepts into the social movement of ending homelessness. I am here with you today, although this uh, presentation is pre-recorded, I'm actually alongside you live in this session. So if you have any questions, feel free to use the q and I'm happy to answer them along the way. There'll also be time at the end of the presentation for questions as well. Before we jump in, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge that I am on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas. These lands are protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, and I appreciate the contributions of the First Nations, uh, Métis, and Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples who have cared for and shaped and strengthened communities from coast to coast. I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to live and work on these lands. As a settler, I also need to acknowledge that I've directly benefited from the painful history in our country and am committed to doing better by unlearning the beliefs, attitudes, and actions that have contributed to oppression and discrimination and the murder of Indigenous peoples in this country, especially women and girls. I'm also committed to supporting Indigenous businesses as a small act and supporting and promoting the strength and skills of Indigenous peoples today. The purpose of this session is to give you some insight into how to drive positive change and innovation in your community to end homelessness. I encourage you to take notes, go ahead and jot down anything that resonates for you. Again, if it resonates, feel free to share that in the Q&A as well. Um, jot down any questions that come up for you. And as we go through the session materials, um, feel free to, uh, again, use that Q&A as, uh, as the presentation is going on. I also just want to highlight, uh, just sit back and relax, uh, take the information in. I encourage you to spend the time to reflect, not to worry, the presentation will be made available to you after the session. And so if there's anything in the presentation that you want uh, for reference, um, you can use that. You don't have to write down a bunch of notes frivolously um, throughout. So I want to start by talking about system transformation. And here's an example from the healthcare system. So in the pre-modern world, life expectancy for an average person was about 38 years of age. And then something happened around 1920 and continues to happen today. Our life expectancy as a result has nearly doubled. Can you guess what that is? It's improvements in healthcare uh, intervention or medicine. So healthcare continues to improve, even though they've seen this progress, they continue to improve each and every day. Changes result through continuous systematic adaptations to pull health care organizations from inefficient traditional concepts towards evidence-informed methods. And the result is better healthcare outcomes for people. No one wants to toil away with the healthcare improvement efforts, only to see that progress disappear or revert back to the old ways of doing things. Could you imagine if we treated diabetes by using opioids or used shock therapy for depression? I continue to ask, why does our sector struggle to adopt a continuous improvement culture and embrace change based on evidence, particularly when the traditional methods have not lent an end to homelessness and are no longer serving us? Yet we revert to the external influences, which are certainly part of the narrative, like not enough affordable housing. Yet we gloss over the things that we do have control over. My intention today is not to shame, blame, or criticize any past efforts, but rather start to embrace talking about the hard truths in our sector so that we can move towards improved outcomes for the people we serve. Rather than focusing on intention today, I'm going to ask us to turn our attention towards the impact. So homeless, serving, homeless services were never actually designed to end homelessness. And now new challenges are before us, such as taking meaningful action towards reconciliation and improving diversity and equity in our systems. 
On top of that, there's also a need for technological innovation and connected policy and research to practice, all while shifting political culture and public will. At the same time, this is all happening and occurring um, while we're trying to become increasingly more effective. If we're serious about ending homelessness, and I mean really serious, not just saying it, we need to redesign the fragmented and reactive homeless response model that we're currently using and acknowledge that it no longer serves our purpose. So in the domain of leadership capabilities, system transformation is aimed at generating the strategic ability to create the changes required. In the work of ending homelessness, this domain of leadership is more important now than ever because more sophisticated leadership requires understanding and addressing fiscal, technological, and professional challenges, especially when integrated into a human service system, which is becoming more and more the norm across Canada and really around the world. To clarify, when I use the term leader, it's not about position or title necessarily. Leaders are people who influence, people who make decisions, and people who are accountable to the homeless this response system. So as a reminder, you signed into this session to learn about the fundamentals of system change. We'll dig deeper into understanding what invokes change. And I'll finish off the presentation with some practical tools and tips and resources that you can take away and try out right away in your local community. Again, a copy of this presentation will also be made available to you post-conference. And I invite you to take the time to listen and reflect and share those reflections um, or any aha moments that you're having, any challenges that you're feeling um, in the Q&A with your colleagues who are also joining on this call. Before I jump in, I'm going to ask you to bear with me for just a moment because I need to highlight the concept of system change. System change happens in this model where it, it change actually occurs. It's important to emphasize that system change is a deliberate process intended to transform behaviors so that new sustainable patterns can emerge. Notice that I'm not using words like plan, project, um, or any other of those things because those are simply tools to help with the change process itself. So let's dive into the change process a little bit. There's three elements that are at play during any change process, the regime, which is ultimately your current way of doing things or the way things are done today. The niche, which are the new emerging innovative and best practices and ideas. And then there's also the landscape, which is the context with which the work is occurring. So that's usually the things that are happening in the political and economic sphere, uh, more of a, a national concept, context. System change happens when pressures from the landscape and the development of strong innovative and alternative solutions in the niche combine together to disrupt the regime. Within this dynamic, there are different actors and different actions, all operating at different levels. You can start to see why our heads spin a bit when we talk about change. Successful system change occurs when you're aware and strategic in how your observations of the system dynamics, that's processes and people, are working or not working and you're positioning yourself to influence the behaviors occurring within those contexts. So let's start by taking a look at some fundamental principles of system change. I'm gonna highlight eight very common ones, and then I'm gonna dig deeper into a couple of them. So let's start with understanding what we mean when we use words like transformation and change. In the human service sector, System transformation is a term that we often use to describe the modifications of day-to-day -day actions to improve overall outcomes for the people we serve. The transformation is about an evolution. It's about modifying core beliefs, long-term behaviors, and practices to achieve desired results. The term change is typically a shorter-term response. Think of it more like the mechanics of a system, if you will. Imagine the evolution of a baby chick Hatching, that's transformation. But to get there, a million tiny and rapid processes are occurring within the egg for the chick to develop and hatch. That's change. So changes need to occur in order for the transformation of the system to take place. And the system is a continual process of improvement through changes. 
and it's continuing on an ongoing basis until the system achieves its ultimate goal. And in this case, that's ending homelessness. So here are the eight most common principles of system transformation. For the purpose of this presentation, as I mentioned, I'm gonna dig deeper into three of them. Um, and those three are the ones that I've observed most communities currently struggling with across Canada in the effort to end homelessness. Those three are seeing ourselves as part of the system, clearly framing the problem that we're trying to solve, and finding the simple within the complex. If you're interested in the other five, feel free to go ahead and research those on your own, um, or you can contact me and I'd be happy to schedule a coffee chat with you to talk about it further. My contact information is available at the end of this presentation. So let's start with the first, which is seeing ourselves as part of the system. We're all part of the system that we're trying to change. Being able to see this allows us to sharpen our awareness and attune ourselves to the feedback and relationships that are occurring, both at an individual level and understanding our collective actions combined within the system. It's so important to cultivate mindfulness, humility, and acceptance for the complexity that we're working within because it opens up space for reflection, which in turn can make us strong, resilient agents of change. Again, if we're serious about ending homelessness, we need to stop emphasizing problems as if we have no control over them and instead harness that energy into problem solving. Would a medical professional stop treating a patient if they didn't have the right conditions or equipment? Of course, they would advocate for those better conditions, but they would still be doing whatever they could to improve the person's life, irrespective of perfect treatment or the conditions with which they're treating the person in. The second principle that I'd like to highlight is how we're framing the problem. System transformation does not require perfect knowledge, but it does require actions that we need to take that are rooted in an understanding of what we're actually trying to solve. Why does this matter? Because sometimes problems can be explored by considering them at multiple different levels, or what I like to refer to as frames. For example, the problem of a lack of affordable housing can be framed as an economic issue, a political issue, a policy issue, even an operational issue, and so on. How you choose to frame the problem at a local level at any given time unveils the possible solutions that you can focus on to innovate and iterate. In the example that I just mentioned, if you want to affect national policy um, towards more affordable housing, then one of your solutions might be an advocacy campaign. But if you want to influence access in your local community, the limited affordable housing that is available, then the action may be testing new prioritization processes through the operational lens. Accurately framing which part of the problem you're trying to solve and the level that you're trying to solve it at will help you stay focused on the specific solutions that you can actually test and iterate. You may be wondering what a rhino with a magenta horn is doing in this session. So let me explain. Elephants and rhino horns have been poached to the point of near extinction. The good news is, is that poaching is actually now on the decline worldwide. The decline, however, was not because of tough policies on crime or new laws or even large scale seizures at the borders. Success in a decrease of poachers has led to several small changes such as scientific non-harmful methods of making the horns unvaluable to the poachers by a simple coloring technique. Total disclaimer, the coloring technique does not change horns to magenta and no rhino or elephant is certainly walking around um, with a magenta horn, but you get the point. I'm asking you to find the magenta in your system transformation efforts, those simple solutions that you can act on right now um, and dig them out and test and iterate. How you do that, I'll explain it through an activity that I like to use. Uh, it's by IDEO, and it's where you look at seemingly complex problems from another sector to come up with as many possible solutions to the problem with a group of stakeholders. So for example, how many ideas can small groups of two um, work towards in five minutes? You can even use this example of um, eliminating poaching um, for rhino horns and elephants. And part of the fun is just letting your imagination run wild. 
Then you share and narrow down the ones that you think would be most amenable to testing and iterating. In the built for zero method, um, we then use uh, the plan do study act, which is the model for improvement um, to test and iterate these sorts of ideas that emerge in the homelessness serving system. Um, but the point is, is that get yourselves out of the mindset of the system which we work within every day, because it's hard to come up with new ways of doing things. Start with another sector, you know, any type of problem and workshop it together in your community and then revisit um, in the, that exercise for the homelessness serving sector. All right, so we've talked about some fundamentals. I'm going to take us now to one of the most important um, topics in change uh, processes and in system transformation, and that's the human side of change. So oftentimes, here's what we all think change should look like or does look like. There's a new innovative idea. We talk about it. We plan it out. We implement it. We assume everybody's getting on board and working on it. And ta-da, a new, a better um, result has occurred. Unfortunately, change doesn't work that way. Instead, Change is actually really messy. Um, sometimes we have to go back and reiterate. Um, sometimes the things that we assume don't work out the way we hope. People aren't always on board. Um, and we have to go back and revisit. It kind of feels like taking one step forward and two steps back because change is hard. And I'd really like us to start to begin just to accept and embrace that uh, the hard parts of change is normal. And it's going to occur no matter how hard we try to avoid it. So even when change goes according to plan, there is supposed to be this period of chaos and resistance and uncertainty. It's intentional. It does not mean that the change is going off the rails. It's simply part of the change process because we're all human and it's humans that are leading the change efforts and humans that are requiring to change their behaviors. It's simply just human nature. So let's explore some helpful tips and tools to navigate that period of turbulence and chaos. The first that I'd like to talk about is that we focus on the aspects of change a lot of the times in this sector from the technical perspective. For example, if we're implementing coordinated access, we might focus on the intake and assessment forms, the processes of coordinated access. Um, likely that would require some type of business process change um, we communicate those changes to staff. We might even provide some training. But here's the thing. Change is actually less about the technical and more about the behavioral. Remember that system transformation is about changing behaviors. We need to uncover what's going on in people's hearts and minds because change is about asking people to behave differently in their work. The hard part is that people are naturally inclined not to express what they're feeling or thinking about their individual struggles or challenges for change, and here's why. We are not biologically designed to be motivated to change our behaviors by using logic or rationale, which is oftentimes how we talk about things, the technical aspects of the change process. But they don't compel us to change because we're actually not motivated to change um, by rational reason. We're actually motivated to change when we are triggered emotionally. And that part of that emotional trigger happens in a part of the brain called the limbic system. The limbic system decides, should I change my way of doing things? Now, the tricky part is, is when we try to explain why we will or won't change, we actually can't tap into the limbic system because the limbic system does not have language or does not articulate language and so then we use the neocortex part of our brain, which is where rationale and reason comes from and where our language comes from to try to verbalize it. But guess what? It's usually gonna come out like a technical concern too. Why? Because these two parts of the brain don't actually speak to each other. That's why it takes digging deeper, a lot of self-awareness and reflection, having hard conversations to understand not just what we think, but how we're feeling about the change. Continuously revisiting the why, leading with our intentions, clarifying any assumptions is so important, but rarely considered. We are in this work because we care about people. Use that skill set to work authentically and humanly with the staff in the sector. And remember, even then, 
change is still going to involve a period of chaos and challenges. So you're not trying to necessarily completely eliminate the chaos. You're trying to help support people through it um, with a little bit more ease. Let's talk for a minute about some of those assumptions that I just mentioned. So assumptions, perceptions, and uncommunicated expectations are weapons of self-destruction, especially in this line of work. When was the last time we communicated our assumptions at work? When was the last time we asked someone, do you know what's expected of you in a meeting? Have you ever invited or been invited to make a conscious choice to support the homelessness system transformation work? If you have, when was the last time that you checked to make sure people are still with you? How often do we utter the words, I need your help and here's what I'm asking of you? If you're having a moment of panic, just relax. It's totally human nature that we don't operate in this way um, when we're talking about any type of change work, again, because we're so focused on the technical. I'm going to guess that 99% of us on this, uh, in this session are in this same boat. Why? Because humans don't naturally communicate in this way. Yet when it comes to changing behaviors, we need to be able to verbalize our assumptions, perceptions, and expectations very clearly because those are the things that will help us support people through the process of change. So I've talked a little bit about some of the theories and fundamentals and concepts. I'd like to now turn our attention to some of the pieces around the change management. So change management, again, it's a tool that helps us move through the change process and ultimately helps people move through the change process. And there are lots of different models. Um, no one is better or worse than the other. It just depends where you want to put your focus and energy. For example, if you want to focus on some of the more systemic challenges, then the McKinsey model might make more sense for your community. If you want to really dig deep into the transition for people in terms of their behaviors, then the ADCAR model may be more appropriate for you. Or you can use a minimum, or sorry, or you can use a combination of any of them. At minimum, if you're leading change, you should have some type of structure for the process if it's impacting more than two people. And when I use the term process or structure, I'm not referring to having a big official plan. It doesn't have to be complicated. Just a one-pager outlining specific components of the model for change as a reference point so that you can stay focused and help to communicate the parts of the process clearly to others. There are countless examples online. If you just Google change management tools, look in the images, you'll find a slew of templates. You can use one of those or adapt um, multiples uh, into your own context. Communities who are able to find the balance between thinking through the process with intention, coupled with having the bias towards action, are the ones who are realizing reductions in homelessness. Why? Because all of our time then isn't consumed by reacting to the competing demands. It helps to set a clear path and next steps, even if it just starts out very small at first. So the next time you have to make a change, see if you can scale it down to a unit of one, one staff, one team, or one agency before jumping into implementation right away. It will make your efforts and the efforts of those who are requiring to change their behaviors more manageable, and it will allow you to see if you'll get the results that you actually intend before putting all of your time, money, and resources into an implementation plan. The most common themes in any of those change models that I had just mentioned are the following. Being really clear about your why, uh, some type of uh, clear um, inquiry and plan around communication, digging into people's motivations, and iterative improvements based on evidence. I'm going to narrow our focus down on communication for the purpose of this presentation. It's one of the biggest opportunities for improvement in our line of work. And to be clear, I do think we communicate quite often and um, well in our work day to day. I just don't think we're communicating effectively to invoke the change that we require yet. So let's talk about how to do that. Remember, people are motivated to change through an emotional response. You may know Simon Sinek, and you might have even read his book, Start With Why. He discovered the reason that some organizations achieve extraordinary results, while others in this, with the same resources don't, 
is that successful organizations know how to inspire action by effectively communicating the vision so that every single worker in the homelessness response system is operating under the same core beliefs. And they know their role, not just within their own program or agency, but in the context of the broader system. Do you have a set of key messages that every leader in your community uses to communicate the why? If not, consider pulling one together and highlighting those key messages every opportunity that you have. That could look like stating the purpose up front in a team meeting, having people talk about their own whys in the team meeting, um, presenting those key messages at a board meeting, or stating them and sharing them in newsletters. Agencies need to become part of the collective. And so working together to achieve a common purpose is how the system transformation actually occurs. Communication is also important skill set in any change process um, for when you're communicating to the people who need to hear the message. So communication in essence is actually about the receiver and not about the sender necessarily. As an agent of change, it's tempting to throw out all the information to your receivers at once. I've been guilty of it myself because I say, see, I've thought of everything. Don't worry, it's all under control. This is inauthentic and it just overwhelms people and it causes them to disengage or focus on filling any of the cracks that you might not have thought of yet. Invite people into the process, ask for forgiveness up front, communicate intentionally and strategically. Ask yourself, what do people need to know right now in this moment of time? What am I asking of them? And what type of feedback are you inviting in? There are two levels of communication. So complex systems can be viewed at a micro level, which is the smallest possible unit within that system, like a document, for example. And it can be leveled up to the macro level. So seeing the whole system, which is a collective of the agencies, processes, programs, and the people that are working within that system. Everything is interconnected between the macro and the micro and vice versa. The important part is understanding how to effectively communicate at both of these levels and all of the steps in between. This matters because every well-functioning system studied to date focuses on the relationship between the parts because that's what makes the system work. Think of it like uh, the mechanics of a clock. If one part or gear in that clock wasn't functioning, then the whole clock would stop working. What I'm going to walk you through are two different examples of how to communicate at the macro micro level. I'm going to start with a simple and generic example, and then I'll move us towards an example within the homelessness response system. Let's start articulating at a micro level first, and let's use the example of a lamp. Can we connect the lamp to a micro or system level? So let's give it a try. Let's imagine this lamp is in your living room. The living room is in your house, your house is in your neighborhood, your neighborhood is in a city, town, or region, which is in a province, which is in a country, which is in a continent, and the continent is part of a world, which is part of a universe, and so on and so forth. The lamp is the micro connected to several other components that are layering to become the macro. You need to be able to make the connections in between the lamp and the universe and deduce the universe to the lamp. Let's now try an example in our sector. Let's start with an intake document. That intake document is used to understand a person's needs and preferences and likely the eligibility for a particular service um, that they've entered into at an access point like a shelter. Based on the person's needs and preferences, they're prioritized. Once prioritized, they're matched to housing. Once matched to housing, they move in. Once they move in, they're stably housed. That's one less person experiencing homelessness in your community, which contributes to the reduction of homelessness locally and ultimately working towards an end. The point isn't whether this process is true or not for your community, but rather understanding the overall goal, how to deduce the overall goal to a person's daily tasks and how to connect people's daily tasks to the overall goal. Try to describe from a micro and macro level and vice versa the next time you're making the change. You may also find 
that you're able to highlight where within the steps between the micro and the macro, the change is actually needing to occur and what you're actually asking people to do differently. You may also find when you're outlining or articulating the steps between the macro and the micro or vice versa, that you'll find bottlenecks or other opportunities for improvement that you can see when you start to really unpack how the parts of the system fit together to make the whole. If it takes more than step, six steps to get from the micro to the macro, it might be too long. Think about how you can connect people to, house, to housing faster or more effectively or efficiently by eliminating some steps, reorganizing the steps, or even doing some of the steps in tandem. All right, and the last part of communication that I'm going to hone in on is one of the hardest parts, which is having the hard conversations, especially in change process. As people, we're generally conflict averse. We tend to want to avoid the hard conversations, both in our personal lives and in the workplace. It's much easier to avoid the elephant in the room, even if the elephant is stepping on our feet. Here's why having the hard conversations are so important. Consider the point of view from the person who needs to change. Not having the hard conversations makes them feel unheard, unvalued, and confused. Hard conversations are actually an opportunity to put empathy into action. Consider if the person can contribute meaningfully and do their job in the absence of this conversation. Remember, assumptions, perceptions, and unclear expectations can kill relationships. Consider the legacy that you're building as a leader if you run from difficult conversations. So I'm sharing with you right now some tips on how to have the difficult conversations effectively. And you'll have a copy of these tips here on the slide at the end of the uh, presentation or after the presentation that you can refer back to. So to sum it up, um, here's some final sort of tips and tricks. Uh, all of this requires time to ultimately to understand your stakeholders, especially if you're doing business virtually. Your ability to be a good communicator depends on how well you've understood and internalized the key messages yourself about the changes underway. Don't assume that just because you've communicated something that people are necessarily going to understand it and understand it immediately. People typically need to hear a message, especially if it's about change, seven to eight times at different points in time using different mediums to truly take in the meaning of the message and what you're asking of them. People leading the change effort tend to spend their time working on the system, while the people most impacted by the change are working in the system. Recognize that you're likely spending a great deal of time with this change because it might be your full-time job, but others may not be as immersed as you. If you want people to change, you need to view communication as part of an ongoing process rather than a series of activities like an email or a meeting or a newsletter. I'm going to spend the remainder of our time together translating some of these concepts into ideas into really uh, specific and practical tools for you to take away and try. I'm going to pose a challenge to you that you implement just one thing that you've learned in this session today over the next month. And I'm going to offer you a way to stay on track and hold yourself accountable. So if you have ever trained um, for a marathon or any type of race, or if you are a runner, you might have heard the term accountability buddy. Essentially, this person checks on you to see if you're staying on track with your program. I encourage you to find an accountability buddy at work and to ask them to hold you accountable to the one thing that you're going to try to do differently in terms of your um, role as a change agent. Have them check in and offer feedback to you. And if you don't have one, I'd be happy to be your accountability buddy if you send me an email by November 12th with the one thing that you're going to try. And again, my contact information is at the end of this presentation. Now we've talked about the fundamentals of transformational change, viewed the importance of the why. Let's focus on getting a little bit more clear about the applications of some of those concepts we just reviewed. By coming to this presentation, you are likely a change agent in your community in some way. A change agent is just someone in the homelessness response system who's designated to either lead, coordinate, and or support a change process. There are five characteristics of a change agent, and I'm gonna highlight them and go into more detail with a few. So let's start with the vision. We talked about the why before, 
it requires and uh, warrants restating the importance of this why. So the question is, do you actively cultivate um, the why clearly and often? Remember some of those examples that I mentioned about stating the purpose up front in every meeting that you're having or asking people to share their why at the start of a meeting. Do you actively cultivate trust and manifest honesty? For example, you share your decision-making process with others. You provide rationale when someone doesn't agree with you if you have to say no. Can you invite in personal feedback without taking it personally and then acting on it humbly? I challenge you right now to think about someone in your sector that you're feeling particularly challenged by. I'm gonna ask you to consider having a heart-to-heart -heart with that person. In that heart-to-heart, -heart, I'm gonna ask you to share why the work matters to you and what you're most concerned about in terms of the change processes. I'm gonna ask you to invite the other person to do the same. And then I'm gonna ask you to ask them for their help to achieve the mission and describe exactly what that would look like to you. Again, you can invite them to do the same. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the last uh, agent of change um, concept that I wanna share with you in more detail today. And that is patience yet persistent or what I like to call positive disruption. Part of your job in leading a change is to also positively disrupt the usual way of doing things with intention. Change is happening all around us, whether we like it or not. So we can continue to allow the change to happen and respond to it, or we can be strategic and choose how the change will occur and impact it will have on our local homelessness response system. So I'm gonna be asking you to brave the space of talking about the elephants in the room and using some of those tips around having the hard conversations. So here's what positive disruption can look like in practice. We know that any time a change is occurring, there is a need for an increase of knowledge um, out of the normal way of doing things or how we typically think. And it's gonna be your role to disrupt the usual patterns of our thinking and working. In my experience, many organizations are acting on dated, anecdotal, and inactive information. Nothing worked before it will work again, just simply doesn't serve the mission to end homelessness. When we demonstrate the power of disrupting the normal way of thinking by adding in new knowledge and innovation and listening and applying that innovation, we're better able to adapt and facilitate imaginative ideas. Again, how you're disrupting this is inviting in um, feedback, having the hard conversations. And I would also suggest that we dig deeper when we're talking about issues, again, because oftentimes when people are resisting or thinking in their usual patterns, they're basing that on their own knowledge, which is technically grounded, or sorry, which is grounded usually in the technical. Think past the technical, understand the why you need to change, and focus on the principles rather than the processes up front. Remember that you're the traffic, meaning that you're contributing to the system as well as working in it and on it. Here are some ways on how to see yourself in the system. Every one of our actions has a ripple effect on the system. It reaches far beyond how it impacts ourselves, our teams, our department, our colleagues, our organization, even on the system itself. It ultimately affects people experiencing homelessness, which is why it's so important to carve out time to be mindful and reflect on the work. For example, when I was driving home uh, from work pre-COVID, I keep the radio off and revisit the day through some reflective questioning. So find the time that works for you. That could be in the shower, going on a walk, uh, exercising, preparing dinner, journaling, whatever makes most sense for you. I'm gonna share with you now some of the questions that I would ask myself in those reflective moments um, of course, there's a number of questions that may be um, relevant or meaningful for you. Just find whichever ones work best for you, but I'm going to share a few now that I have found helpful myself. So when I was having uh, a particularly hard moment or facing a problem, and oftentimes there was more than just one, I'd pause and ask first what role I was playing in that issue and what assumptions I was making about the people involved in the issue itself. This was a painful but necessary part of the step for me. 
I'd then commit to trying one new approach, or often it was with um, a person, and just having a conversation and revisiting the issue again. And I often found that my perspective, perspective would change as a result and thus lead to less frustration. Here's a few more examples of some of the reflective questions I also used. So as a recovering perfectionist, I'd ask whether I was trying to do things right or do the right things. I'd also really try to reflect uh, and tease out the differences between holistic and reductionist viewpoints. So for example, the holistic viewpoint is being able to see the system as a whole and understand how the changes that I was leading were impacting other parts of the system, not just the particular, where the particular change was occurring. Um, do most efforts that you're working towards um, in one part of the system affect or impact other parts of the system? Oftentimes, um, we're so focused on the change within the one aspect of the system, but not seeing the whole part. I would also uh, reflect on failures because they happened all the time. Um, how could I give space for learning from these failures? How will I act on that learning? Uh, sometimes I would hold debriefs about the failures and name my accountability and describe what I was committing to doing differently or better. And I'd invite in others to do the same. The more you celebrate failure, the more it allows people to open up uh, and share their own failures or shortcomings in the work and to celebrate the failures because what the failure actually represents is an opportunity to learn and grow. You now know something that you didn't know before. Here's some other reflective questions that I'm gonna share with you. Um, the most effective way to communicate and to lean into understanding change beyond the technical aspects is starting with good questions. So I'm gonna share some examples of the kinds of questions that you could ask that could lead to greater insight to help you through some of that chaos and disturbance in the change process that we talked about earlier. I'm gonna give you a moment to read the questions. I'm not gonna read them off for you because they're all here on the slide. Um, I've also shared a resource on this particular slide at the bottom. And again, the presentation will be made available to you afterwards. Um, so you can uh, look at that resource, which is essentially a stakeholder analysis matrix tool that can also lead you through some of this questioning. And you can use that tool or walk through that tool yourself or as a project team or a group. So on this slide, these are particular questions related to the people side of change. So digging in deeper to understanding people's motives um, and really connecting in to uh, the emotional part of the change process, which is essential in order to change a person's behavior as we talked about. I'm going to give you a few minutes to just read those questions. These are tips to help you work cross-functionally. So whether that's with across agencies, across different teams, again, I'm going to give you just a few minutes to read those, or a few seconds to read those questions. These questions will help you reflect on how the processes within the system uh, change work uh, occur and how you can really dig out when you're running into challenges um, or thinking about how you're going to support people through the change process um, of the system transformation work that you're doing. The point of these questions is at any point in time, if you're unsure of the answer, the exercise is to prevent or try to stop yourself from making assumptions and instead going out and asking the questions of the person or agency. And lastly, these are some questions to help you through negotiating the change with others. I know we've covered a lot. So here's a slide uh, that you can refer back to after this session uh, to kind of take some key points away that we had talked about. And if there is one thing to take away from today, it's this. The secret of successful change is to focus on energy on building the new instead of fighting the old. Be intentional about how you're choosing to show up. Never has this been more relevant in our work to ending homelessness. Look ahead, lean in with curiosity, and stop spending all of our energy and time trying to fit the old ways of doing things into the new. I ask you to support people through change and encourage us to stop resisting change or trying to prevent the chaos from occurring. Embrace and accept that it's messy. Be authentic, communicate with intention, 
remember that every minute that we all spend debating, arguing, or invalidating our efforts is at the expense of people getting housed. Thank you so much for your time today. I'm now going to pass it back over to our moderator, Chantel, for any questions.